Gresham College presents The Historical Collections of the Guildhall Library by Dr Peter Ross. Um, it is the intention of this lecture to narrate something of the history of Guildhall Library and its collections with specific reference to one area in particular, the material relating to cookery, food and drink. In the past, the collection might not have been regarded as worthy of serious attention or description, with the possible exception of the material relating to individual food writers, like that of Elizabeth David. But very recent research by my colleague, Val Hart, has begun to throw some light upon the cookery texts, donated by a number of individuals in the latter part of the 19th century, donations which really form the foundation of this extraordinary collection. Indeed, perhaps the most extraordinary fact about this collection is that the great majority of the books, now numbering more than 10,000, have been acquired through donation and bequest, and that only about 10% or less have been purchased. As I hope to demonstrate in this lecture, such a collection is strictly outside the original acquisitions policy of what is essentially a Library of London history. But I hope too that I can go some way towards showing that what has been until relatively recently a Cinderella collection deserves its place on the shelves along with other important collections um, like those of the London Livery Companies, the Sir Thomas More and Charles Lamb collections, and indeed the Gresham Music Collection. But first, let us look at the history of the library itself so that it can place all this material in its historical context. The recent publication by the Museum of London on the archaeology of the Guildhall precinct has greatly enhanced our understanding of the history of the Guildhall and its library. This talk draws heavily on that publication and on the writing of Dr Caroline Barron. But first we must go back over 400 years to the great Elizabethan historian of London, John Stowe, for our first introduction to the library's history. Writing in his survey of London of 1598, Stowe noted that adjoining the chapel, that's Guildhall Chapel, on the south side was sometime a fair and large library built of stone and roofed in slate with three chambers on the ground floor and a large room above where the books were housed. Desks were provided in the upper room where the books were chained to the shelves for security. The outside of the building was ornamented with the arms of Richard Whittington and the letters WB for William Berry, the library's benefactors. Mention of these two city merchants takes us back another 175 years to the founding of the library in the 1420s, early in the reign of King Henry VI when plans for a library within Guildhall College precinct would have been under consideration. The first Guildhall Library was built between March 1423 and September 1425 by the executors of the Mercer and former Lord Mayor Richard Whittington, the Dick Whittington of pantomime fame, and this is a later picture of what Whittington might have looked like, and the executors of another Mercer, William Berry. Although neither man had specifically made provision for a library in his will, Money had been given to the city for charitable purposes, and it is likely that the actual initiative to create a library was taken by Whittington's executor, John Carpenter, the common clerk. But it is clear that Whittington had taken an interest in libraries during his lifetime, as he had made a donation towards the founding of a library at Greyfriars in the west of the city. On completion of Guildhall Library, probably in September 1425, the city gave full responsibility for its running to the executors and it is likely that John Carpenter, who himself was to donate books to the collection, managed the library until his death in 1442. According to Stowe, before its dissolution, the chapel and college were served by a warden, seven priests, three clerks and four choristers, and it was one of these college priests who was made responsible for the library. By 1444, the library was in the hands of Master John Clipstone, one of the college chaplains, who petitioned the city to be confirmed in his livelihood, having great attendance and charge in looking after the library. Clipstone died in 1457 and Thomas Mason became keeper. The only other keepers whose names are known are Edmund Allison, who died in 1510, and John Church, who was keeper in 1536. Apart from Stowe's brief description, we have a few more clues as to where, what the building looked like and where exactly it was situated. The copper plate map view of London of 1559 and the derivative Agas map, which is the one shown here, uh, show a building to the south of Guildhall and its chapel that is probably the library. We can see that a four-bayed construction that pushes above the foreground building, indicating it must have had an upper floor. So I've highlighted that here 
uh, in the sort of yellowy green colour. Um, we think that is probably uh, a depiction of Guildhall Library and the only depiction that survives um, from, from the original library. Um, although at times schematic, the maps have been shown to be accurate as far as they go when depicting large public buildings of the city. The appearance of Guildhall Library may have resembled two contemporary buildings which do survive today, the Vicar's Library at Wells, and that's this one here, and Froman's Chantry at Winchester College. At the slightly later Wells building, the lower floor is occupied by a chapel, but a library was on the upper level with a roof of wooden beams covered in slates, as at Guildhall. The library at Froman's Chantry, Chantry sorry, at Winchester, which also has a chapel on the lower floor, is a more precise contemporary of Guildhall. Both the Wells and Winchester buildings are lit by four windows on each side on the upper level, the same as the building that is depicted in the 16th century maps of London, which we, we believe to be Guildhall Library. We can only speculate what the interior of the library may have looked like, but it must surely have been very similar to the library at Hereford Cathedral, that's the one here, with its wooden shelving, benches and desks, and with the books chained to iron rods running along the edges of the shelves. Um, I thought this was rather an interesting picture, actually, because um, I always thought that they would be sort of chained directly to the shelves, but as you can see, um, there's iron rods running along the edge of the shelves which go into a sort of clamp here which locks at the corner. So they would have been chained to each of those iron rods. Um, we still have one book in the library that still has its chain on. It's not from the original library, uh, but we do get it out to demonstrate what a chained book looks like. Um, there are a number of chained libraries in the country which we could have used as an example. Um, there is an early photograph which I came across uh, which purports to show the interior of that Vickers Library at Wells uh, and it's a somewhat less glamorous set of shelves, apparently covered in dust and cobwebs. I'm assuming this is a sort of late 19th century uh, image. You can see there's cobwebs running up here in the corners. And one can only wonder what our conservators would make of the condition of the books if they were kept in what looks rather damp conditions. I just hope that Guildhall Library in medieval times was more like the Wells, the um, Hereford Cathedral, than what this one looked like. But who actually knows? The Museum of London's recent publication on archaeology in the Guildhall area contains vivid reconstructions of the 15th century precinct that provides us with an idea of how the library may have, been, may have appeared in the context of the neighbouring college and the Guildhall itself. These dump demonstrate the somewhat enclosed nature of the precinct, occupying, as it does today, almost an island site. But the entrance gateways and the narrowness of the medieval Guildhall yard point towards a more private space than the modern complex. So just pointing out that's where the library is in the reconstruction. Uh, that's the chapel, that's the Guildhall itself. Um, this is Basinghall Street, and along here, this is uh, St Lawrence Jury, so this is where Gresham Street is now, and the entrance to the yard is still comes in that way, but uh, none of these buildings uh, exist anymore, so there's a much bigger yard in the middle. So this would have been much more private space with two gateways which were locked at night. So, as you can see, this is the sort of main island site. So it really is a precinct that most of these buildings had things to do with the, the Guild Hall. Just compare that to the, the modern uh, guild hall. So there's the bigger yard, still some narrow entrance by the church, a much bigger yard. Um, the art gallery is moved back from where the library used to be in medieval times. That's the old library, which I'll talk about um, later. And the modern library is in this section here, which again I'll talk, talk about a bit later. During the recent archaeological investigation of this site, uh, five foundation piers built of chalk, mortar and gravel were discovered which appear to be part of the foundations of the library. However, the best preserved section, which is the one shown here, of the library was the, the latrine at the west end of the building. The archaeological report, report seems to take great delight in describing the capacity of this library cesspit, which they claim contained 2,400 gallons of latrine waste up to the black tide mark on the walls. <laughs> so you can see that there, lovely black tide mark. Um, and double that volume when it was filled to the top. It is somewhat unclear if this pit beneath the site of the medieval library, but almost within Guildhall Yard, was for the public, public use and access from outside or for private use of library staff and visitors inside the building. The city had earlier provided public lavatories in other parts of the town, and a new one was to be provided by the executors of Richard Whittington. 
Thus, the city appears to have got its priorities right by providing public lavatories long before they provided a public library. It has been claimed that Guildhall Library was the first public library in England, and that may be something to do with the fact that it used to be called the Common Library, and there's some confusion about what that actually meant. It may mean, just mean the community, the Commune of London, and nothing to do with it being common, i.e. that everybody could go there. Um, maybe some citizens were allowed access, but it was primarily for the use of the priests at the college. Little is known about where the library acquired its first books, or indeed what they were, as no catalogues survive. But well, we can guess that most of them would have been religious works. As early as 1425 to 7, the library had attracted some private benefaction from the grocer William Chichely, who bequeathed £10 to be disposed on, dis, distowed, bestowed on books. In 1452, Richard Corden of Silver Street, just around the corner from here, um, left at least part of the residue of his goods to be used for the Common Library of London. Hugh Damlett, sometime rector of St Peter's upon Cornhill, made a bequest to the library in 1476, and in 1517, one John Grant bequeathed a Latin-English dictionary and a mass book to the library to be bound in boards and to be tied with a chain to the aforesaid library. Relatively recent search by Dr Neil Carr has traced some 20 surviving works which he thought had been in the medieval library, but it's clear that some of these must have been housed in the book room between the mayor's court and the inner council chamber rather than in the library itself. These items, probably legal works, would have been used for the use of the officers of the Guildhall rather than the college priests. But it is indeed probable that a number of those works identified by Carr and surviving in other li modern libraries were indeed in the medieval library. The modern Guildhall library now has just one book that we can be certain had been in the medieval library. This is the Aurora of Petrus de Riga, an early 13th century metrical version of the Old Testament which bears a 15th century inscription in Latin that can be translated as Master John Martill gave this book to the common library at the Guildhall of the City of London. The library reacquired, the modern library, reacquired this book from an, the antiquarian bookseller Mags in October 1926, some two years after it had been sold at auction. One other work which may be a survivor of the original library, a 14th century copy of the Chronicles of France, can probably be identified with a volume of the Chronicles returned to Guildhall in 1516 after having been a long time in the keeping of Robert Fabian. It also seems likely that some marginalia in this volume is in the hand of the same Robert. We know little more of the history of the first library, its contents or its librarians, until the Reformation, when following the Chantries Act of 1548, the chapel, college and library were confiscated by the Crown. Although all were subsequently repurchased by the city, Sir John Gresham was the chief, a chief agent in negotiations, neither the college nor the library was refounded. Before the end of 1549 and with the assent of the Court of Aldermen, William Cecil, Secretary to the Protector Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, who's shown here, removed all such books of St Augustine's works and other as he now desireth that remain in Guildhall Chapel. The Court of Aldermen clearly thought the Protector was just borrowing the books as they, as they asked by gentle request upon delivery of the books that, having perused them, he will return them to the said library there to, re to remain to such use as they were provided for. The Protector Somerset, or at least his secretary William Cecil, sent three carts to the city to collect the entire library and remove the books to the Duke's new mansion, Somerset House on the Strand. As Stowe was later to record, this loan was never returned which would no doubt help to explain why in November 1549 the city decided not to re-establish the collection, even though, it had been been brought, even though they had bought the building back from the Crown. It is possible that some books escaped the clutches of the Duke, as they may have been in the book room that we've already mentioned of the Guildhall, rather than in the library. This might have been the case with the surviving copy of the Chronicles of France. It's hardly surprising that the city obeyed the commands of the Duke of Somerset, who was also the king's uncle, as at this point he was so powerful that he was able to act without reference to the Privy Council. But the Duke was to fall very quickly in the months after his removal of the library's books. I'm not saying this was as a result of removing our books, but uh, following a virtual coup d'etat, he was arrested, brought before the king and charged, as Edward the king himself summarised, with ambition, vainglory, entering to rash wars in my youth, enriching himself of my treasure, following his own opinion, and do doing all in his own authority. 
In February 1550, John Dudley, Earl of Warwick, emerged as leader of the council and, in effect, Somerset's successor. Although Somerset was released from the tower and restored to the council, he was executed for felony in January 1552 after scheming to overthrow Dudley's regime. The king noted his uncle's death in his chronicle with, the Duke of Somerset has his head cut off upon Tower Hill between eight and nine o'clock in the morning. The fact that Somerset was charged with felony means that his possessions were not necessarily forfeit to the crown as they might have been had he been charged with treason. But what exactly happened to Guildhall Library's books so soon after they'd been taken, uh, presumably then at Somerset House, is unclear. There may be an opportunity in the future to pursue this line of inquiry, but for now it remains a mystery. In March 1550, the library building at Guildhall was leased to John Ayliffe, keeper of Blackwell Hall Market, which was on that sort of diagram, it's just to the right um, as we're looking at, at it, at the annual rent of £5 on condition that he always use it as a common market hall for the sale of cloth and none otherwise. The desks were then sold, and by John Stowe's day, at the end of the century, the building had been lofted throughout and was converted into a storehouse for cloth. The corporation made no attempt to repair the loss of their library until the year 1824, when on the motion of Sir Richard Lambert Jones, it was unanimously, res unanimously resolved that it be referred to a special committee to inquire into the best mode of arranging and carrying into effect in the Guildhall a library of all matters relating to the city, the borough of Southwark and the county of Middlesex. Within two months, they reported as to what apartments should be appropriated for the purpose and the expense involved in fitting them up. And they, they directed the town clerk to prepare a schedule of all the books in his custody. Within another 18 months, the committee was able to report that they had acquired a number of valuable books um, relating to the matters, customs, laws, privilege, and history of the city, the borough of Southwark and neighboring counties. In 1828, William Herbert was appointed librarian and the library was opened for use. By the following year, the 1,700 volumes which, with which the library opened had grown to 2,800, and its print collection amounted to nearly 2,000 images. Amongst its early acquisitions was a complete set of the London Gazette, which we actually still get today. We get it daily today. We have a complete run from 1665. Uh, was, the complete set was purchased in for 250 guineas, which was a very large amount of money to spend in the 1820s, along with a complete set of the Gentleman's Magazine, and the European magazine and 380 volumes of newspapers. Right from the start, the committee realised that its mission was to create the greatest collection of London books in existence. And although the library has since developed in other directions, this objective has never been lost sight of. And books relating to London have always had a first claim in considering proposed purchases and donations. The, cur Excuse me. the current collection is known to be the greatest on the history of a single city anywhere in the world. By 1831, it was already clear that the library had outgrown its accommodation, although it is unclear exactly what space the library was occupying. For a time, it may have uh, used the rooms above the porch of Guildhall itself. In 1832, the library contained 3,200 volumes. By 1835, it had reached 4,800. The committee, although still giving preference to London-related books, was acquiring the works of all the best English historians, ancient and modern, as well as works on constitution and parliament, along with dictionaries and glossaries. Five years later, the number of books had grown to nearly 10,000, including an extensive series of city pageants. And this is an illustration from uh, the Fishmongers pageant of uh, the 1630s, I think it is. Uh, this is uh, actually a 19th century copy hand-coloured copy, but we also have the original in the collections. Uh, so extensive series of city pageants and royal progresses and accounts of the plague and the great fire. In 1843, the library acquired probably what is, what is probably its most precious possession, a deed of purchase for a property in Blackfriars signed by William Shakespeare. The deed was bought at auction and the city paid £145, the equivalent of around 10000 today. This was probably one of the canniest investments by the city. As should the signature come on the market today, it's believed that bidding would probably start at 5 million and might sell, according to some estimates, for 50 million. So that's a good investment of 145 pounds in the 19th century. I'm, I'm sure the city will never sell it, but who knows. In 1847, Mr. Philip Solomons presented 400 volumes of Hebrew literature and 950 proclamations from the reign of Charles I to that of William III were purchased. 
1853, the Library Committee reported in favour of establishing a free library for the use of the inhabitants of the city. Up until this point, the main purpose of the library was to serve the offices of the corporation. However, at a public meeting held in 1855, the proposal to adopt the Library Act and introduce a free public library was rejected by the ratepayers. So they rejected the library for themselves, really. In 1857, the use of the Guildhall Library appears to have been small, as in six months just 532 visitors were reported. In 1862, the book budget was increased from 200 to 300 per annum, and the following year, the Library of the Dutch Church, Austin Friars, was accepted. This collection of mostly theological works included the first edition of Froissart's Chronicles of 1495, Livy's Decades of 1485, and the first Dutch version of the Bible of 1477. In 1865, Mr. William Overall was appointed librarian, and with 18 months of his appointment, the Guildhall Improvement Committee recommended the building of a new library at the cost of £25,000. However, this scheme did not get off the ground until a meeting of the Common Council in July 1869 approved the motion. So it took them quite a long time to actually get around to um, doing something about providing a new library. Designed by the then city architect Sir Horace Jones, architect of the Tower Bridge, it comprised the library, which could be converted into a reception space for ceremonial purposes, the newspaper and directory room, the committee room, with Guildhall Museum and the strong room occupying the basement. Um, I'll just describe. This is um, a sort of um, architecture drawing um, taken from, if you know Basinghall Street, then this is Basinghall Street in front of us here. Um, Basinghall Street is just not as wide as that. You couldn't possibly get that view in reality. So the, the, person, the artist has taken sort of liberties here. Uh, this is the library part here. The entrance was off Basinghall Street. This building still exists. It's called the Old Library now. And this part under here was where the museum was, the Guildhall Museum. Um, exclusive to the site, the building cost £57,870, 16 shillings and fivepence. Who knows what the fivepence went on? But was finished in 1872. A substantial stone structure, it adopted the perpendicular Gothic in style in order to complement the neighbouring Guildhall building. And that's the building we can just see behind in the, in the image. Um, by then, the library contained about 60,000 volumes. The library opened on the 5th of November, 1872, and that year, that, sorry, the library opened on the 5th of November, and on the 13th of February, 1873, the Court of Common Council passed the following resolution, that considering the additional accommodation provided for readers in the new library and fully recognising the paramount obligation of every municipality to afford its citizens the fullest opportunity of acquiring an intimate knowledge of the literary treasures in its possession, the court hereby declares that its library shall henceforth be devoted to the free use of the public. Hooray, we hear you say. Um, I'll just say something about uh, the library. The library still exists, the old building. Um, it's been stripped of uh, all of these shelves and there is still a little gallery, so... Oops, sorry. Um, so there was a gallery uh, higher up where books were kept, and there were bays all the way down. There are still bays, but no books in them. And the bays were lettered, um, A, B, C, etc., and right round the other side. And um, letter A and um, bay H were rare items because they were behind the staff desks. And in the modern library in our stores, we have bay A and bay H. They're just sitting on the shelves. They're not in bays at all. We've kept those um, shelf marks because if people look at catalogues from this period, they will find references to those bays. So when we moved to the new library, we kept those references, even though they don't relate to anything in reality. Um, one of my colleagues, who retired some years ago, used to work in the, in the old library. And you heard reference that it was sometimes used for ceremonial purposes. Well, at certain times of year, it was used for staff dances. And the library staff were given the day off. They cleared all the desks out put down the dance floor, had the dance, and then put everything back the next day. So it was a good day off, and you got a dance as well. Um, a remarkable amount of work uh, just for a dance, clearing all those desks away. The philosophy of the library at this time is reflected in the choice of portrait sculptures in the spandrels of the arcade. Personage, personages were chosen to represent history, poetry, printing, botany, etc. So you find depicted, amongst others, Stowe and Camden, Shakespeare and Milton, Gutenberg and Caxton, Purcell and Handel, Ray and Gerard. And I took, I took this actually this morning, just because I wanted to get a, 
uh, a, a good view of it. And it took me about four days to get into um, the old library because it's used now for functions. And there were functions taking place every single day that I couldn't get in there. So this morning I nipped in really early and took this photograph. The stock of books continued to rapidly to increase. In 1873, the Clockmakers Company deposited their library and museum at Guildhall, where both remain today. Some other livery companies followed suit with their own libraries, including the Gardeners and the Spectacle Makers. In 1889, a large gift of duplicate books were received, was received from the British Museum. In 1891, the Parish Clerks deposited the London Bills of Mortality, an extraordinary statistical record of disease in London from 1664 to 1829. We have added to this particular collection and can now extend the dates from the end of the 16th century to the middle of the 19th. This monument to weekly record keeping is the longest continuous record of disease and mortality anywhere in the world. Utilising these records, historians have been able to trace, for instance, the relentless march of the plague week by week and parish by parish as it progressed across the city in 1665. This is just a page from one of them, and it's a page uh, obviously not from 1665 because the plague is just taking, uh, you can see it's there, just one person buried that week from the plague. Uh, it's, it's good fun to have a look at all the other diseases that are listed. Tissic, dying of teeth, spotted fever. Um, if you do look at the ones from 1665, by the time you get to August, the figures for the plague for one week, 8,000 people buried from the plague for one week. And that goes on for a few months, 7,000, 6,000, 8,000 people. You can watch it gradually build up and you can study um, where it, the plague moves from uh, the poorer parishes like St Giles uh, into the, more, the wealthier parishes in the middle of the city. So an extraordinary record of, of disease. The Chapman bequest of 1895 brought to the library hundreds of 19th century plays whilst the purchase of the Alfred Cock collection added works relating to Sir Thomas More. Guildhall Library would seem an appropriate home for this material, as More was born in Milk Street, just across the road from Guildhall, married in the local parish of St Mary Aldermanbury, and may, may indeed have been a reader at the original medieval library. The image here is from uh, our copy of More's Utopia, from the Cock collection. Donations and purchases continued to pace over the next few decades, including part of the library of the London Institution on its closure in 1913. It was from here that the library acquired its Shakespeare First Folio, which is shown here. It's one of the best copies in the world, being uh, complete and in very good condition. But there were dispersals too. The corporation's private lending library, of which catalogues were published in 1900 and 1911, was partly dispersed and partly added to the general reference collection. The Library of the Dutch Church in Austin Friars, deposited in 1863, was removed in the 1930s and mostly incorporated in Lambeth Palace Library. But some notable books were sold. The Bible collection was given to the British and Foreign Bible Society, while the Phillips collection of erotica went to the British Museum. The National Dickens Library, given in 1908, was returned to the Dickens Fellowship in 1926 and is now in the Dickens House Museum. 28,000 books, including 10,000 published before 1851, were destroyed when an incendiary bomb fell on the library on the night of the 29th to the 30th of December 1940. Losses included all the sale catalogues, the Swedenborgian collection and the collection of the Fan Makers Company. As a result of this damage, 83,000 books were subsequently removed to the vaults of the Old Bailey, where they spent the rest of the war. The Elsevier collection along with other Dutch books, was given to the University of London Library in 1950. One of the most significant deposits of the 1950s was the Gresham College at Library, with its important collection of early music, including an autographed manuscript by Purcell and the earliest surviving texts of Thomas Tallis' Bem in Allium. Other collections that, might have, that found their way to Guildhall included 3,000 books and pamphlets by or about the essayist Charles Lamb, which formed the Charles Lamb Society Library, 54 books on fencing, a library of material relating to archery, 106 pre-1851 books on shorthand, an antiquarian horological society collection, and 75 items from Elkanah Settle, including many of his presentation bindings. You may know about this gentleman, Settle, um, would uh, uh, get a, a, a book or have a book printed uh, that really might relate to a particular aristocrat and he would have it bound or he would bind it in a very posh uh, armorial binding and then he would offer it to the aristocrat 
who then might accept it and then pay for it or might reject it. If it was rejected, then Settler would just remove the cover and put on a different cover and try another nobleman to see if they would buy it. <laughs> and sometimes he didn't even bother to remove the cover. He would just stick uh, a leather patch over the bit and just send it off. And we have examples uh, of ones that obviously were rejected and ones that were rejected more than once where they have multiple layers of bindings on them. This is just one example that he, he, he produced. The bombing during the Second World War de devastated the area around Guildhall, and for the second time in its 600-year history, the hall itself had lost its roof, the first time had been during the Great Fire of 1666. Bombing had slightly damaged the library, but had destroyed the council chamber and many of the offices belonging to the corporation. Much of the 1950s and 60s was spent making good these losses, and new offices were built to the north, though the council chamber was not rebuilt. The corporation decided that in developing the West Wing, they would incorporate a new modern library, more suitable, so they thought, for a modern collection. They also had an eye on the Victorian library, building, Victorian library building, which they wanted to use as a permanent ceremonial reception space. And as you can see by my trying to get into the library over the last few days, that's what they use it for. The, the old library, as it is now called, was depicted shortly before its closure, and we can see that its layout and had changed little over the intervening century. So this was done, uh, presumably, in the late 60s or, or early 70s. And you can see more clearly the, uh, the upper level where the galleries were, that sadly all, all stripped out. The only bits we have remaining, there's an umbrella stand, which was in the new library, was removed from here and taken to the new library, which I think now is in the art gallery. Thus it was, um, in 1974, the present incarnation of Guildhall Library opened, designed by the architect Sir Giles Scott, son and partners. It ranged over five floors, two of which were purpose-built for the storage of the now vast printed books and manuscript collections. So this is the building as it, as it is today. Um, it was designed in what they thought was a sort of 60s version of Gothic to sort, sort of blend in in some ways. Unfortunately, I don't, still don't think it's an attractive building, but give it another 50 years and we might think it's a classic of 1960s design, but it might take longer than 50 years. Um, <laughs> The library opened uh, on the 21st of October 1974 and it took seven weeks to wheel many trolley loads of books to the new home. It was a very modern library for its time. A Country Life article suggested that with its card indexes and easily accessible shelves, it could well be the most efficient machine for the retrieval of information in the world. Um, it, it was a very efficient machine, um, mostly due to the um, pneumatic tube system which ran through the walls. So when you ordered a book in Guildhall Library, we'd put the ticket in a little tube and send it down the tube system to the stores here and the books would be returned within about 10 minutes. We still return them very quickly. Um, unfortunately, we can't use the pneumatic tube system. We have an electronic version. The library was originally laid out with three sections, printed books, prints and maps and manuscripts, but this has more recently been adapted to accommodate the City Business Library. The print room moved to London Metropolitan Archives along with some of the manuscript collections. But all the printed books remain on site and can be accessed, even where they are stored three floors below ground in less than 15 minutes. Despite its extraordinary history and the collections of Guildhall Library, it remains a public reference library open to everyone without formality. So that's a bit of a mad dash through the history of the library to give some context to what I want to talk about now, which are the uh, books relating to food. So how, after detailing the above historical collections, many closely related to London's history, is it that Guildhall Library has acquired 10,000 books on food, cookery and wine? The short answer is that it has been serendipitously and without the intention to build up such a vast and now very important public collection. We can trace its origin, however, back to the late 19th century when, in 1887, the widow of Thomas Staples, master of the Cook's Company, gave 239 cookery books, 75 of which dated from before 1851. This was added to by a deposit, a small deposit of a, a library from the Cook's Company itself and a bequest by Robert Miller, a wine merchant and master of the company in 1888 and 1889. From a total of 195 books which Miller bequeathed the library, 76 were food or cookery related and included Hall's The Queen's Royal Cookery of 1719 and the Queen's Closet Opened, The Queen's Delight, and The Complete Cook, all from 1671, and that's the ones that are shown here. And in fact, they're tiny, tiny little books, half the size of a paperback, um, but uh, very significant in the history of the cooking. 
Um, Hannah Glasses, uh, the art of crooked made plain and simple was also deposited at this time, and a 17th century uh, manuscript of, cookeries, of cookery recipes, uh, which is now in the manuscript collection. By any measure, these bequests and donations were remarkable collections for individuals to have acquired in the middle of the late 19th century, in the middle to late 19th century. Very few people were collecting cookery books at this time, certainly not material from the 16th, 17th or 18th century. In fact, I don't know of anybody who was collecting, significantly collecting cookery books apart from these two people who donated to Guildhall Library. There may be others, and I'd be interested to find out if anybody was doing that in the 19th century. Collectors of antiquarian books may have acquired examples of recipe books as part of their general collections relating to the history of the book or, or of printing, for instance, but not many were actually interested in the subject matter of these books. Thomas Staples, however, had a professional interest as well as an antiquarian one in acquiring cookery material. Both he and his brother John were closely involved in catering to city institutions, livery companies and to the corporation. They were proprietors of the Albion Tavern in Aldersgate Street, where many organisations held their banquets and the tavern provided food for civic occasions elsewhere. In 1864, for instance, the city press records that the Lord Mayor's Day banquet was well served by Messrs Staples of the Albion. In that same year, they converted their business into a limited liability undertaking and continued to manage its affairs as managing directors. The Staples brothers were also successful wine merchants, which is probably where they got most of their money from, and acquired a significant fortune and influence in the city. When Thomas Staples died in March 1896, he left a considerable fortune of nearly £50,000 to his widow. She, with some haste it seems, made sure that Thomas's cookery book collection uh, was passed to Guildhall Library. The first such bequest of its kind and the foundation of the book and wine food and wine collections that we see today. However, on its arrival at the library, material was not catalogued as a discrete collection, but was subsumed into the general reference collections, which is sort of significant um, in that we uh, sort of didn't know it was there in some ways until more recent uh, researchers sort of put it all back together again. It is only now, with the aid of surviving acquisitions registers, and this is, this is one here that lists the Robert Miller bequest from uh, 18, uh, 89, 18, 18, 1898 to 1899. It's only now, with the aid of surviving acquisitions registers, that we are discovering how important this collection, the donations of the Cook's Company and the Robert Miller bequest, actually were. Modern online catalogues now allow us to draw together records and recreate collections, even when the material may have been physically dispersed across the miles of shelving in the library. This research has revealed that the earliest cookery book in the collection uh, was acquired through these Victorian donations. Cristoforo de Messis Burgo was a steward of the house of Este in Ferrara, serving in 1524 to 1548 at the court of Alfonso I and Urquele II, where he organised many grand banquets. <clears throat> His cookbook, the title of which translates in English as A New Book on How to Prepare All Types of Dishes, was first printed in 1549 in Ferrara and eventually appeared in ten editions. It was intended for those who prepared princely feasts and discussed not just recipes but also logistics, decor and cooking. Uh, this is Guildhall Library's copy, which appears to retain its original 16th century binding, as you can see on the left. I'm intrigued to know just where Staples acquired his copy, and if he could in fact read Italian. But it's by no means the only early Italian cookie book he owned, as the bequest also included uh, Mattia Geiger's Tre Trattati, a book of carving instructions published in Padua in 1639, and containing detailed diagrams for carving various cooked animals, birds and fish, and this is one I could show to you. Some of them are really gruesome, uh, which I thought I won't show to you. Um, it also includes illustrated instructions on how to fold napkins into numerous decorative shapes. <laughs> In fact, the instructions, the earlier pages of the instructions, are basically just what they show down here. It just shows you starting off, and then suddenly you may meant to be able to make <laughs> things like this. So... I, don't think it's, I think it's sort of showing off, really, that this is what he could do, not necessarily that anybody else could do. By the early 20th century, it was clear that the food-related collections at Guildhall were beginning to attract scholars and writers on food. Most notable amongst these was André Simon, the French-born wine merchant, gourmet, and prolific writer on food and wine. In his 66-year writing career, Simon wrote 104 books, carrying out much of his research at Guildhall Library which was later to acquire the library of the Wine Trade Club that Simon had helped to set up. 
Seamont naturally built up an extensive library of his own and also helped to found the Wine and Food Society, which eventually became the International Wine and Food Society. Much of Seamont's private library was acquired by the society, who in turn added from their own collections, bringing the total up to around 3,000 books. Eventually, this material also came to Guildhall Library, where it is now known as the André Seamont Collection. In February 1965, Seamont established the André Seamont Award for Gastronomic Literature with a prize of 100 guineas. The award continues to this day, although now the prize is £2,000, and is judged by the trustees of the André Seamont Memorial Fund. Each year, all the shortlisted books for the award are donated to the collection at Guildhall, and the library continues to add further donations from individuals and institutions, so this particular collection continues to grow. The strength of the André Seymour collection is in later 19th and 20th century material, with extensive holdings of the works by Ambrose Heath. That's the ones you can see here. Ambrose Heath is, to a certain extent, forgotten, but in the middle of the, uh, of the 20th century, he was prolific, and he's, he produced loads of these books in the late 30s and throughout the 40s. Even during the war, he was producing these. Um, some of them are very beautiful, as they have covers by Edward Borden. And um, People now pay hundreds of pounds for the books, for the covers, not for the contents, but he was a very good food writer, Ambrose Heath. Uh, we also have Elizabeth Craig and even Fanny Craddock in this collection. But the collection also contains hundreds of examples of cookery pamphlets and ephemera, wine list menus, products and recipe leaflets, material that is often overlooked by other institutions. We sort of specialise in collecting that sort of ephemeral material, so lots of our collections have that, um, that sort of attachment to them. By the 1970s, the collections were becoming better known, and amongst our readers and researchers was Elizabeth David, arguably the most important English food writer of the 20th century. By this time, David's writing had increasingly based, was increasingly based on research into social history of food and cooking. She moved away from recipe books, as such, so that her later publications often contained fully researched history of the subject. In my opinion, her masterpiece is uh, English Bread and Yeast Cookery, published in 1977. The simplest way to demonstrate the extensive nature of David's commitments to researching and writing the history of her subjects is to point out that the first bread recipe in this book does not appear until page 256. <laughs> but I recommend you read the first 255 pages because it's a brilliant book. David's researches clearly took her all over the country, but she made regular research forays to Guildhall, and one story of those visits has been passed on to me by a former colleague at the library. Elizabeth David would usually visit on a Saturday, Arriving in the morning, she was stopped by the fish pond, which still is on the corner of Gresham Street and Aldermary and just outside the library, where she would lower into the water a string bag containing a bottle of white wine. <laughs> Come lunchtime, having completed several hours of research, she would return to the pond and retrieve a nicely chilled bottle of wine to enjoy with her picnic lunch. When Elizabeth David died in 1992, Guildhall Library was invited by her executors to acquire much of her extensive cookery book collection. This was the head of the now famous auction, which took place at Phillips some months later. Although this was one of the few occasions that the library paid for a collection of cookery books, and at the time might have felt that the asking price was somewhat high, it was quickly realised that we may actually have acquired a bargain when at auction everything else went overestimate, one collector paying £300 for an earthenware jug containing several wooden spoons. And it might be uh, that jug there, but that's not an earthenware jug really but somebody might have paid £300 for a jug with some of those spoons in it. Um, Prue Leith, the uh, food writer and TV cook, bought the um, kitchen table from Elizabeth David's kitchen. When the books first arrived at the library, it was realised that they contained hundreds of post-it notes, scraps of paper, postcards and even parts of unpublished essays. David, a very private individual, had recorded her often caustic remarks about the books, the authors and even individual recipes on these ephemeral scraps. My colleague Chris Nichols spent many hours removing each item, recording where it was from, and mounting them on acid-free paper. These are now preserved in the library, and the public can read David's comments, where she describes, for example, Fanny and Johnny Craddock as possibly demented. <laughs> the American food writer Waverly Root as a pitiful, pitiful phony, and an Ulster Women's Institute recipe for Italian salad as possibly the worst recipe ever devised. What then is the use of the collection of so many food-related works? Surely cookery books are just practical manuals of instruction. As you can see, this cook here is neglecting her practical manuals of instruction. And there's actually, if you get up close, you could see that on the shelf up here, there's a copy of Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery. She's actually reading um, uh, Waverley novels, so Scott novels, 
and she's neglecting her, fire, her roast, which, which she's allowed um, ashes to fall into the dripping pan, which is the greatest sin a cook, cook could ever, ever make. The cat's running off with the fish, the dog's stealing that, and the parrot's shouting, fire, fire, thieves, thieves. <laughs> um, but it's a wonderful example of what a kitchen would look like in sort of 1820. Um, as the food writer Eileen White has written, there can, cookie books can be a starting point of studies relating to topics far more, di far, more di far more diverse than merely food preparation. White goes on to say that although recipes might not be literature, they can be used for literary and linguistic study. Until recently, cookie books were not generally perceived as a source of academic study, but they can have the same intellectual, theological, historical and literary values as almost any other Guildhall Library collection. Everyone must eat, and the history of the procurement, preparation, and presentation of food over the centuries must be of interest to many, and is part of the social and economic life of any society. To quote from Eileen White one last time, cookery books reflect the expansion of international trade, reveal the essentials of everyday life, and embody attitudes and personalities. Like any text, they can be examined for sources, derivations, and dissemination, and can inspire a search for the background of an author. They can be used by people other than cooks. Perhaps I can demonstrate briefly the value of this by taking examples from different centuries. Take The Court and Kitchen of Elizabeth, commonly called Joan Cromwell, published in 1664, after the restoration of Charles II. This book sought to denigrate Elizabeth Cromwell by indicating her shortcomings as a hostess. It was a piece of royalist propaganda showing the protector's household as a world turned upside down in which Oliver's excesses were kept under control by his wife. Thus, the book reflects the politics and personalities of its age. We can contrast this depiction of Elizabeth Cromwell with Henrietta Maria in The Queen's Closet Opened, where she is transformed from a detested French Catholic queen from, before, from during the Commonwealth period into a good housewife. During the Commonwealth period, many distinguished chefs who had served in aristocratic and royalist houses had lost their jobs, and it's likely to be the reason for the sudden wave of new cookery books at this time, as these professionals were in searching for new ways to make money. The political situation in the 17th century also meant that many people were moving up the social scale, and it is in this era that cookery books begin to instruct those unfamiliar with the etiquette of the wealthy, guiding them on subjects such as menus or servant behaviour. By the middle of the 18th century, women cookery book writers were the dominant force, and Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, 1747, was the great bestseller of its age. It is now recognised that she borrowed many of her recipes from contemporary writers. And although she claimed to be hostile to the influence of French cuisine, she plagiarised an adapted style to suit English tastes and pockets of her audience. Her intention being that the book should be used by the mistress of the house to instruct her ignorant cook. That's what's taking place there. Glass offered shortcuts to achieve the rich sources and suggested ways to create dishes with decorative impact using simpler ingredients. Take, for example, her recipe to make ketchup to keep 20 years. Recipes like this, which demonstrate the preservation of food, took up a lot of space in cookery and household instruction books in the, in the 18th century. This book also reflects the influence of Britain overseas as she expanded her colonies and founded an empire. It was a two-way phenomenon, the British food and ideas going one way and new recipes and ingredients come back the other. One final example from the 20th century takes us in a completely different direction. The isobar menu, and it does, you can just about make out when it says isobar here, it's a sort of aluminium cover to the book. It dates from the late 1930s and comes from the Christopher Driver collection at Guildhall Library. Driver was the editor, editor of the Good Food Guide. The isobar was in the basement of the Lawn Road Flats. That's, that's then there. Um, a radically designed modernist building in North London, also known as the Isocon building. From the starting point of a single menu, we can take our research in a number of different directions. We can, for instance, use it, use it to trace the fashions in middle-class housing. The studio-style modernist flats were equip, equipped with tiny kitchens because the occupants were expected to dine out or eat in the dining room in the basement. This experimental communal style of living attracted several champagne socialists who took up residence at this time, including Raymond Postgate, and that's him there, the father of Oliver Postgate of Pogles Wood fame, who was later to found the Good Food Guide. And... Philip Harbin, who was employed in the basement restaurant of the Isocon building and went on to become one of television's first celebrity chefs. The food and wine collections continue to grow and more recent donations include the Library of Christopher Driver, 
that we've already mentioned, the Hall Garten and Linklater's collections of wine-related material, the collection of Potter and food historian Mary von Drausch, and most recently, a library created by the members of the Guild of Food Writers. Just a few, few weeks ago, we received a donation of hundreds of review copies of cookery books from the offices of the publishers of Olive and BBC for Good Food magazine. So we've got to go through these for duplicates and see if they're worth keeping. What is the future of this collection? Over the last few years, the history of food and cooking has become a serious subject of academic research and the papers published by the Oxford Symposium on Food History and the perhaps less serious but much more interesting Leeds Symposium have led the way in this direction. The media, having possibly achieved overkill with Celebrity Chef, is now taking a slightly more serious interest in food history with documentaries narrating history of food, cooking and servants and dramas about Fanny Craddock and Elizabeth David. Television and radio producers, along with newspaper journalists, are beginning to discover the collections at Guildhall Library. And in the last two years, the food collections have featured on a, no a number of times on Radio 4's The Food Programme, The Great British Bake Off, and numerous other documentaries, including those on the lives of the 18th century cookbook writer Hannah Glass and Mrs Beaton, as well as featuring in articles in The Guardian, The Times, and The Observer, and the food journal Fire and Knives. What was once a disparate assortment of collections is now being brought together, developed, and publicised. In the past, the collections have relied on the personal interests of some of Guildhall Library staff, like the former principal reference librarian, Irene Gilchrist, who's hiding at the back up there, to make sure that they were developed and their place on the shelves justified. But now the library is becoming recognised as a destination for the history of food and attracting further important donations and bequests. Our only concern is the speed with which the collection is growing. It is already the largest public collection in the country. Each year, over 20,000 cookery book titles are published and sales of cookery and craft books account for 10% of all book sales. It is not the purpose of our collection to be comprehensive, but we should attempt at least to collect the most important, most influential, and indeed the most typical publications of our age. So it's in the future, the modern material is as highly regarded and as interesting as that collected by our Victorian benefactors, Thomas Staples and Robert Miller. Thank you very much. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.